May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is a portion, as mentioned earlier, of the Gospel lesson today. We turn to Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Or again, we read as follows that portion of God's word, which will be the sermon text. Jesus said, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. So far the text. In the name of Jesus, through whom we have peace with God, dear fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true only living, creating and preserving triune God, let's talk about this unforgivable sin against the work of the Holy Ghost. Let's define it, because so many people have questions about this. They even wonder if they've committed it themselves in great fear and trembling. Well, let me first assure you, if you think you've committed it, you haven't. Because it's only the Holy Ghost who could bring you to that knowledge of your sin. And if you've rejected the Holy Ghost, you have no consciousness of your sin and the curse that's upon you. So if you confess your sins and confess that God by rights should curse you, that's a sign that you haven't committed this sin. You cannot commit this sin unconsciously. If you commit this sin, you would know it. Let's define what this sin against the Holy Ghost, against the work of the Holy Ghost is. When a person attributes to the devil works which all the fullest evidence shows him is the work of of God the Holy Ghost, but yet even against that knowledge, even against that proof, he says it is of the devil, that is the sin against the Holy Ghost. It cannot be done accidentally. It cannot be done unconsciously. It can only be done deliberately with good knowledge to the contrary. It cannot be done in thought. It can only be done outwardly in speech because it is called blasphemy. And blasphemy can only be given, uh, committed outwardly in speech. Jesus, in this context, had just healed a man in a very, very bad condition. A man who was possessed of the devil to the point that this man was blind and deaf and dumb. And immediately, instantly, Jesus had driven the demon out of this man so that all of these physical maladies were gone. Now, to drive a devil out of a person and heal him miraculously like this it's obvious to anyone seeing this that this has to be the work of God. If anything is the work of God, this is. To be instantly healed from this demon possession and all these horrible maladies has to be the work of God. But many of the Pharisees and scribes who witnessed this, who saw this, and who had to know this could not be the work of the devil. This is the work of God, the triune God, specifically the work of the Holy Ghost, who is trying to bring these people to faith in Jesus. For them to turn around and say this openly, not just in their thinking, but in words they said to, to the Jews around them who respected them and, and respected their teaching. They said to these people, about Jesus 
after he'd healed this man, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Now that's blasphemy against the work of the Holy Ghost. Against all their better knowledge, all the proof and all the evidence of who Jesus was and who he claimed to be, this great sign, this great miracle. They said, give us a sign. Well, here's your sign. It's so obvious. And yet, against better knowledge, out of their hatred for Jesus, they blasphemed the work of the Holy Ghost being done through Jesus. So they were committing this unforgivable sin that Jesus speaks of in our text, the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. That's what this sin is. Now, to give you some other illustrations here, let's take the example of Saul. Not the King Saul, but the New Testament Saul, the one who became the Apostle Paul. Now, if there's anybody that you could maybe suspect committed this sin against the work of the Holy Ghost, you might think, well, it was Saul before he was converted. But, even though it tells us clearly about Saul's life as a Pharisee before he came to faith in Jesus, and it says he, he uttered blasphemy, the Bible says that Saul committed great atrocities against the work of the Holy Ghost in creating the Christian church, the New Testament era church. He uttered threats. He uttered cursings. You might think, well, he committed this sin against the Holy Ghost. He did not. Why not? Because he did it Sincerely out of ignorance, the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that before Saul was converted, he didn't know any better. He sincerely believed that he was serving the true God. The God of the Old Testament, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He really believed that. And he really believed in his heart that Jesus was not the true God, that Jesus was a fake and a fraud. And God sees the heart. And so when Saul spoke these blasphemies, he did it out of ignorance. But when he saw the evidence, when it was proven to him, Jesus spoke to him. He saw Jesus. He heard Jesus, the Bible tells us. Remember, he was on the road to Damascus, and Jesus shone like a light and spoke to him, and he fell to the ground and was struck blind. And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? There he had the evidence that he had been wrong, so wrong, and he... He didn't continue his hatred towards Jesus and his disciples. He converted. He changed. And later on, Saul would say this, as we have recorded in one of his epistles in the Bible. I was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So that's why he did not commit this unforgivable sin against the work of the Holy Ghost. When he came to faith, when he saw the evidence and he became the Apostle Paul, all of his sins of blasphemy had been forgiven. As Jesus says in the first part of our text, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Paul certainly fit that criterion. 
and his sins were forgiven when he came to faith. Now, if when Paul or Saul had seen Jesus and heard Jesus on the road to Damascus and later, if he would have continued to, con to attribute that appearance of Jesus and those words of Jesus to the devil and had said so in words to other people, then Saul would have committed the unforgivable sin against the work of the Holy Ghost. But he didn't do that. When he saw the evidence, he converted. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. That's a scary thought. Shall not be forgiven. The whole concept of our, our Christian faith, the whole message of the Bible is a message of God's forgiveness of sins. That even though we've sinned, he forgives us for Jesus' sake. And for Jesus to say, there is a sin which shall not be forgiven. That's a serious thing. Because to not be forgiven of a sin puts a human being in the same hopeless condition, the unalterable position as the devil. The devil has sinned. He's gone against God. The devil isn't forgiven, shall not be forgiven. He is in an unalterable, damned condition forever. And all human beings who have left this world in unbelief, without, without faith in Jesus, are also in hell with the devil, and their sins shall never be forgiven. They are in a hopeless Condition of unforgiveness forever. It is an unalterable position. Jesus said of the rich man in hell, you cannot pass over into heaven, ever. You will be in torment forever. A hopeless, unalterable, unforgiven condition. That is the same condition of the person who has blasphemed against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto him. It's a hopeless condition. Now why is that? Why is there this one sin, this blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, that God will never forgive? Here's the reason. It's the Holy Ghost that brings people to faith. It's the Holy Ghost, as we have confessed in the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, who is the Lord and giver of life. It is the Holy Ghost who converts an unrepentant, dead sinner and brings him to the second birth. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, born again of water and the Spirit. Holy Ghost is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Spirit of God. It's His work to convert people to faith. Without Him, we cannot say Jesus is Lord. Now, the Holy Ghost wants to bring everyone to faith. But if you make it impossible for the Holy Ghost to do His work, he cannot bring you to faith, and without faith, you are cursed. You are hopeless in and of yourself. You need the Holy Ghost to bring you to faith. And that is why, as we mentioned in the scripture readings earlier today, often the Bible compares the Holy Ghost to a fire. Let me tell you a little story. It's a true story about two trappers back in the early days of the United States on the frontier, they were trapping out in the mountains. And it was winter, 
depths of winter, snow on the ground, it's cold, and they were out trapping and they were looking for shelter. They were looking for some kind of human habitation, a cabin, uh, a shed, a tent, a fire, anything, any other human beings that they could uh, sh seek shelter from in the winter, at night. And uh, they looked all day and they found nothing. Uh, there was no human habitation around. And finally the sun went down and now it got dark. And they were, they were cold. They were wet. They were in the dark. They were exhausted. And it was kind of a hopeless condition. Well, their only hope was to start a fire. So they, in the dark, they're groping around for wood. Now all the wood is wet. You ever tried to start a fire when everything was wet? But that was their only hope. So they gathered what they could of wood and so forth, and, and they tried desperately to start a fire. And over and over again in the dark, they were trying to start this fire, and it just wasn't starting. It was getting more and more hopeless. Finally, spark and a flame, a little flame. And they brooded over that flame. And they took care of that flame and they put a little leaf on it and they, they blew a little bit on it and they tried to get that flame to grow. And finally maybe a twig caught fire. It, and all of their attention was focused on that little fire that they'd started. And after a while, they had built that fire into a, a nice blaze. And from that fire came warmth, heat, and light, and hope. And they were no longer in the cold and damp and darkness. And they lay down to rest, finally, their exhausted bodies. Now, can you imagine if after starting this fire, they had gone over and got some snow, put it in a container, and melted it over the fire, and then threw a bucket of water on the fire. Can you imagine them doing that? That is a sin against the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a fire who, who comes to us through baptism, through his word, through the Lord's Supper. He gives us warmth and light and life. He gives us hope. And if we just throw cold water on it, he can't do his work. And he leaves us. And the Bible says, quench not the spirit. You must have the work of the Holy Ghost working in you, or you're lost. And to blaspheme against the Holy Ghost is like throwing water on the fire, and that's why it's unforgivable. It's not that the Holy Ghost is more glorious or on a higher level than God the Father and God the Son. They are all exactly equal. But why is blasphemy against the Father forgiven? As Jesus says here, all manner of sin and blasphemy. Blasphemy can only be committed against God, by the way. Even blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Blasphemy against the Father, even blasphemy against Jesus, God the Son. Jesus says can be forgiven. But why blasphemy against the work of the Holy Ghost is because it's the Holy Ghost 
who like a fire brings us out of our hopeless, lost, cold, miserable condition to life. It's not blasphemy against the Holy Ghost that's unforgivable. It's blasphemy against the work of the Holy Ghost. What he does, and what he does is he is the only one who brings people to faith. He is the only one that keeps people in faith, in the true faith, in the true God. The Bible talks about being baptized by the Holy Ghost. And a lot of churches have misunderstood this and perverted this into some kind of a special thing that only a few believers have kind of a higher level of Christianity. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible is very clear on the work of the Holy Ghost. You cannot say that Jesus is Lord unless you have been baptized by the Holy Ghost. You can't even be a Christian without being baptized by the Holy Ghost. Every Christian has been baptized, has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, or they couldn't be a Christian. To be baptized by the Holy Ghost is the initiation to faith. You know, when you join a club or something, you get initiated. Well, that's the initiation into the Christian faith, into the Christian church, the true communion of saints. You couldn't be a Christian without this baptism of the Holy Ghost. No one can become a believer in Christ, in the true triune God, without being baptized by the Holy Ghost. So to blaspheme against this work, to, bab to, to blaspheme against this baptism of the Holy Ghost, means you can't be initiated into the Christian church, the family of God. And it places, man's beyond, places a man beyond Jesus' help. There was a farmer many years ago, back in the days of the horse and wagon. He'd hitched up his horses and, uh, to his wagon and gone into town for some supplies. And uh, he parked his wagon and his horses out in front of the store, and then he goes into the store. And while he's in the store, something frightens his team of horses. And they, they start running, they start galloping down the street, pulling this wagon. And immediately, uh, the man in the store knows what's going on. He rushes out and uh, starts to run after the horses. He, he, he cuts them off. He runs across the field, jumps over a fence, catches up at the horses, grabs them by the bridle, and they drag him down the road for quite a distance. But he will not let go. Finally, out of exhaustion, the horses stop. The man lets go of the bridles, he falls on the ground, he's bruised, he's bleeding, he's dying. The townspeople finally come out and catch up with him, and they go up to him and they ask him, as he's laying dying on the ground, why did you do that? The horses aren't worth it, the wagon's not worth it, you're dying. And the man says, go look in the wagon. So they went around, looked in the wagon, and they see the man's little son laying on the hay in the back of the way. The man died, gave up his life to save his son. It wasn't the horses, it wasn't the wagon, it was his son that he was saving. He gave up his life to save his son. Well, that's what Jesus has done for you. A lot of people say, well, you ask them, why did Jesus die on the cross? Why did he go through that suffering and that torture and that crucifixion and that death, even being forsaken of God? Why did he go through all that? You ask people that. See what they say. I've asked people that. And they'll give you answers like, oh, 
Uh, he was just a, a poor, misunderstood man, dying for his cause. Very few people say, he was doing that for me. That is what saves me. Look in the wagon. You want to know why Jesus died on the cross? Look in the wagon. Look at the world. Look at the condition of the world. That's why Jesus died on the cross. He took our punishment for our sins so that we could be forgiven. Jesus says, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Why? Because Jesus took all that sin, all manner of sin and blasphemy of man upon himself so that we would be forgiven. The Bible says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember I quoted Paul a moment ago when he talked about his former life before he was converted to faith in Christ as his Savior? I want to, I want to read the next verse. Remember he said, I was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. He knew he was saved from his blasphemy and his persecution and all the injury he had done to Jesus' church. He was, he was forgiven all of those sins because of Jesus Christ. He had faith in the love of Jesus Christ, that love which put Jesus on the cross. Saul was forgiven all his sins. You are freed from all your sins through Jesus' death. You're freed from your sins. You're separated from from your sins. You're disconnected from your sins. You are severed from all your sins. You will never be held responsible yourself for any of your sins, is what forgiven means. This is the good news. This is the wonderful message of the Bible, God's Word. Homosexuality is a sin. But it can be forgiven. All manner of sin shall be forgiven unto men. Divorce is a sin. But it will be forgiven. Murder is a sin. It can be forgiven. Drunkenness is a sin. Idolatry is a sin. Fornication is a sin. Taking God's name in vain is a sin. Every sin, Jesus says, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Even blasphemy against the Father and the Son, because Jesus took all manner of sin upon himself. But, if people repent of their sins and turn to Jesus Christ alone in faith, their sins will be forgiven. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven. But, to resist the Holy Ghost by openly blaspheming His work of bringing people to faith, calling it the work of the devil, When the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity, attempts to work in you, 
attempts to bring you to faith and keep you in faith cannot, will not ever be separated from you, but will cling to you forever, will not be forgiven. Bible says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Except blasphemy against the work of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.